going to talk about today. What we're going to talk about today is um, where have we been, where are we now, and where are we going? So let's begin with the past. In the beginning, the technology world was without form and void. It was very boring. I'm told that most people did things with their own two hands. Terrifying. But as, over time, complex life appears. And we start developing these new technologies, these new capabilities. And we have these two massive, monstrous uh, organizations that are behind much of it. And driving, uh, driving our technology, but stomping on a lot of things in their way. Yeah. Fantastic thing. 
But at the same time, it was slowly starting to relegate those old timers and those and those initial those first constituents, the IT administrators, into stock energy. It was starting to create a, a, a feeling where they weren't any longer the main focus, and that they and that all the, their ability to contribute was to say, no, 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 wait, wait, you really have to keep the firewall off, or no, 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 we have to, the default has to be set this way, or it's not secure, and. This led to a lot of friction on all sides. And so about two years ago, uh, at Flock in Charleston, uh, we started talking about a new plan. And, that's, and that was that maybe, maybe Fedora, the OS, does not have to be one thing to all people, which, as anyone can tell you, will never be the case. Instead, we decided to try a new thing. We decided to try to split Fedora into three pieces, into three deliverables, three editions. And these are the Fedora Server Edition, which was going to focus on that first constituency. The old, you know, the old guard, the people that have machines that they need to stand up and make sure are still running five and six and seven years from now. And the ones that want to, that want to have hardened defaults, and the ones that want to build a platform to build long-running software on. And then we built, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, and then we also split out the workstation, and that was going to be a platform that was going to be very heavily focused on desktop, with a particular focus on developers and content creators, and you know, uh, as uh, the maker people would like to say, the doers of the world. And then we also had the, uh, ideas for how we were going to build into the new world of containers and rapid deployment, DevOps model. And for that, we also spun up Cloud Edition, uh, and that's doing some really exciting things too. And there's a lot of talks about that this week, and I encourage you to go to them. So that's where we are today. We now have this segment of the Fedora project all to ourselves, and I, and I speak uh, talking to the IT administrators and the people you know, in this room who st at least started out in those places where they were maintaining software for other people. And God bless you. And so that brings us to where we are today. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, neat technologies that we've built uh, into the Fedora Server Edition, which began at Fedora 21. Uh, we've had now two releases, uh, Fedora 21 and 22. Uh, and the 23 Alpha was just released yesterday. Uh, many of you were, in, in, were instrumental in doing that, so give yourselves a round of applause. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the really visible features of Fedora Server today. Um, the, first, uh, the first one, and probably the most visible, is the Cockpit Admin Console. Uh, one of the key uh, fundamental uh, tenets about the Fedora Server project is that we said right from the beginning, everything we do on Fedora Server and everything we ship as part of the Fedora Server must be capable of running headless. Our expectation is that uh, if people start deploying this, they're going to be deploying this in a data center where they may not even have physical access most of the time. And so the idea is that everything we ship has to be accessible remotely by s in some manner. But at the same time, we have an environment where Linux, is a, Linux classically has not been terribly novice friendly. It has not been a place where someone who, even, even someone who has a, a high level of skill in another oper uh, operating system can readily come over and say, oh, okay, I can do those same things here. And so Cockpit has become uh, one of these places where we're trying to address some of that. We're making a discoverable graphical user interface that is remotely accessible. It's, it's web-based with some really cool JavaScript uh, tricks and hacks. Uh, but it allows us to provide an interface that is at least competitive with some, with some of our uh, more obvious uh, competition out there, and allows us a place where you can come in, you can uh, manage the OS in, uh, in a way that is really uh, accessible to human beings. You know, you can come in and you don't have to learn uh, a dozen uh, MVADM commands and three, uh, and three LVM commands in order to set up an extra hard drive on the system. You can, you can boot into, uh, into Cockpit and use a very easy graphical management tool. Similarly, uh, you can configure your, uh, your networks and, your, uh, and, uh, and monitor your logs and take care of a lot of that, uh, your service management through the Cockpit interface without ever having to get into a, get into a shell uh, and with a sufficient amount of on-screen prompting that really just walks you through the process. Um, I, like to, I like to say that uh, one of the things that Microsoft has always done better than uh, Fedora, better than uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, is uh, the, the, their 
Windows Server Console. When you start uh, uh, server managers, when you boot up Windows Server, the first thing it does is pop up a nice little UI that says, hey, here's a bunch of things you might want to do with this server. Click here to do them, and then it walks you through a wizard. Up until Cockpit, what, when, we, when we started up a, a Red Hat Linux system or a Fedora system, you know, we, we, give, we give you a, co uh, a console prompt, and if you're lucky, somebody has bothered to give you a you know, Linux for Dummies book. <laughs> and it's really, really hard to get over that initial hurdle of, well, where do I go from here? So Cockpit is really meant uh, to be that place. And additionally, uh, now with uh, some of the stuff that we're doing in conjunction with the Atomic Project and the, uh, and the Cloud Group, uh, we're also using Cockpit to manage our container storage. Uh, we're doing things like being able to pull down uh, containers from the Docker registry and start them directly from this UI, again, without ever having to look at a console. So we can get a lot of, our, a lot of those really neat services that are available on the registry uh, deployed trivially onto these systems. And again, you can do this without three advanced degrees. And that's a major advancement from where we used to be. Uh, I can't tell you how many, uh, since, since the uh, release of Server Edition in 21, the first real public release of Cockpit, people are talking about it. It is seeing lots and lots of press in the tech, in the tech press. It's, uh, people are coming in at uh, I, I wish they would start sending mailing the cockpit to Bell list instead of me directly, but I, I'm, I'm getting lots of mail. I'm getting at least three or four queries about it every week uh, directly. And so it really is catching attention and it's doing a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, another piece of really cool stuff that it's doing is, uh, again, with the, with, uh, the cloud group, uh, we're focusing pretty heavily on Kubernetes. And one of the things that uh, cockpit does, and I, I wanted to originally have an animation, but I couldn't get one uh, up and running. Uh, this week, but uh, it has a, neat, a really neat topography graph that you can monitor in Cockpit. So when you make uh, when you tweak your Kubernetes configuration, you can watch live as the services come up, where they are where they are running, whether or not any of them had an issue because they're uh, because they're not uh, they're not plugged into the rest of the environment, and you can get a quick uh, heads up view of exactly what your what your cluster looks like. This is beautiful. I've been told uh, also that uh, the Free IPA guys are looking into doing something similar for their replication setup. Uh, and that'll be exciting too. I'm going to be talking about uh, Free IPA a little bit next. Uh, so I see Rob a little bit nodding. <laughs> uh, so really there's a, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff going on in Cockpit. Now, I talked about server being, uh, the focus being on those services that you really need to have stable and, and sustainable for years and years. And really there is no better example for that than an identity management ser uh, service. Uh, in, in Fedora Server, we've elected to use the Free IPA uh, Identity Management System as our implementation of a full domain controller. This is uh, this is becoming really our formal answer to where do we where where do we compete with Active Directory? And so, with Fedora Server, we've made it really really easy to get a, to get at least a proof of concept or small business domain controller set up with close to the click of a button. We're, we haven't uh, quite managed to get it plugged into Cockpit yet, but that's uh, coming pretty soon. Uh, and what this gives us is a really, really powerful interface for, for managing which users you have, which uh, how they are grouped, what machines they have access to. In the case of sudo uh, policy, we have the ability to determine what actions they are allowed to pre uh, perform on individual machines. We have the ability to tell uh, to, it, we, we have, uh, as I understand it, time-based rules coming uh, very uh, coming very soon. Possibly, I don't know if that's maybe 23, uh, but probably, uh, but pretty soon. Uh, and we have uh, we have a lot of ability to to do authorization and really manage at a fine-grained level how you interact with your Linux and Unix-based uh, environment. And a lot of that comes from its integration between Free IPA and Realm D and SSSD and some of these other uh, related technologies. Uh, and, we're, and we're working on other ways to improve on that. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's, again, a, a nice, simplified, uh, and very discoverable uh, web UI. Doesn't require a, a, you know, a graphical environment on the system, but it lets us do a great deal uh, from, uh, with, without, again, any huge background in the technologies under, under the hood. And it's vastly simplified setting up uh, such critical uh, infrastructure as things like your Kerberos single sign-on, and uh, thanks to uh, advances in things like Ypsilon GSS proxy uh, to expand this into a more federated solution as well. So 
we're working very hard uh, going forward to make sure that all of the other stuff that we do in Fedora Server will build upon the domain controller role. From here on out, uh, any service that we produce, our plan is that we won't ship it unless it can, it can basically be plugged into the free IPA trivially. It should, be, it should require nothing more than saying the free IPA server is at this address and that this system will be, will be coming up. Yes, thank you. And the, well, this is a, and this is a uh, essentially what Microsoft has had for years is that everyone has always assumed that Active Directory is available, so everything always supports Active Directory. We want to take free IPA and say that this we assume, we will presume in the Fedora server world that IPA is present in your environment, and we will do everything we can to make it uh, to make that uh, more and more comfortable and more and more easy to do. Uh, I've said I've said this uh, uh, privately a few times, but my personal goal is that. Uh, in Fedora's 24 and 25, uh, it should really be, uh, it, it should be assumed that if you want to get anything really done, you should have a domain, an IPA domain controller. And by Fedora 26, I'd like to say that it shouldn't be possible to bother, to, do, to, to live without it. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's an ambitious goal, and I, I see the uh, free IPA guys uh, a little nervous, so uh, I probably should have warned you about that ahead of time. Not exactly. What I, what I want to make sure is that uh, if we build a generic HTTP server role, which I don't know that we will because that's kind of a complicated s uh, story, but if we, if what, what it should be is that if you deploy that HTTP framework with Fedora server, it should by default come with GSS, with uh, mod off GSS API enabled so that you're, you can use uh, uh, IBM, or Red, uh, free IPA identities to back it. Uh, you can choose not to, but the default case in all situations should be that we assume that this is in play. Uh, you can always, this is open source and all these packages, these are available as packages. The idea here is that we're trying to pack, we're trying to do a new kind of packaging where, we're, we're, we're calling it deployment rather than packaging, where you get all of this, this stuff and it's pre-configured in a way that we think is reasonable, uh, follows modern security <coughs> standards, and will cover at least 80% of the cases. So that out of the box, you don't need to know how all this works under the hood. So we should the, the default case on all of the Fedora server deployments should be it just works. Uh, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, where we want to go next. World domination. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do tonight, Pinky? Now, uh, what do I mean by world domination? What I mean is that I want Fedora Server as a platform to be the default place where new, long-lived applications do their uh, do their prototyping, do their work, and try things out and get their first initial uh, deployments on. And I want it to be very, very clearly a place where it's no secret that uh, that Fedora uh, that Red Hat Enterprise Linux derives from Fedora down the road. And I want it to be the default behavior that people can expect certain things from Fedora Server that they can reasonably expect and we will likely follow in Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and that they want, want to do the work necessary in the Fedora Server to make sure that their applications and their exciting, exciting new technologies will work on the day that that downstream release occurs, that out of the gate they will have a jump on their competitors because they were ready on the same day, not they start looking at it during the beta pro process. And that'll help us because one of the problems that Red Hat Enterprise Linux has, of course, is uh, you know they'll release 7.0, companies will finally start looking at it and realize, oh, well, we need this from the kernel, or we need this from, uh, from uh, libc in order to do this. And so there's a lag time between when, when applications can deploy and then when, of course, uh, users can then start, uh, start uh, testing them. So if we can work with all these people to do this work in Fedora, and, and you know, and in CentOS, and, those, and for those communities that are not going to that want to self-manage, then we have an opportunity to get people to jump ahead. And and frankly, if people want to do if people want to do really exciting new work, they need to be doing it in Fedora, where they have the opportunity to get there first. So that's what I mean by world domination. Is I want people to think and to look at and say, this is the next big thing we're going to do. 
Where are we going to do it? Well, Fedora, of course. <coughs> so, how are, what are we going to do next specifically uh, in the Fedora project? Uh, and how are we going to get to this or some of that? I think part of it is going to be we're going to be pushing these uh, server roles and we're going to be making it easier for <coughs> independent dev folks and ISVs to, de uh, to develop them themselves. And I'd love to, uh, I would love to be able to, say, to see some of these coming out of those upstreams as well. Uh, in Fedora 23 uh, Alpha, which we released yesterday, uh, we have a new, uh, a new server role for memory caching daemon. Uh, this is a first prototype of a role that we are deploying as a container. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit in a, in a couple of minutes as to why that's really exciting. But uh, it, was it was proving out that uh, we can use this same, uh, these same mechanisms. We don't have to necessarily deploy on bare metal, and we can be prepared for, uh, for a future in which uh, maybe you migrate to another, uh, to another, uh, to another form of Fedora, another form of, uh, of for example, Atom. Uh, things we want to work on uh, probably for next release. Uh, we've been talking about uh, developing uh, one of the one of the uh, major pieces that we want to plug into the free IPA world is build uh, build the ability to de declare a, a server, the home directory server for your uh, for your IDM deployment and essentially just trivially set that up and then help and then with some with some additions to free IPA that I want to talk to you about later, uh, be able to automatically push that out to the clients so that they can just so that there's basically no there's automatic discovery and no difficulty trivially just setting up a new a new system to use uh, network mounted home directories. This is really useful in labs, uh, particularly you know school computer labs, uh, Government, you know, government buildings love to have shared machines that, you, that uh, people log into, and this is this is a very common use case that we have always just basically told our customers, well, here's a how-to, and you know, it worked two years ago. It probably still works. Um, we'd much rather have that be a, a core piece of the OS. Uh, beyond that, uh, I'm working uh, with uh, Adam Williamson, uh, who's been doing the packaging of own cloud. Uh, and one of the things I'd love to see there is the ability to, do, to deploy your own personal uh, cloud storage and, and, cloud, and cloud feature uh, uh, server with basically no hassle. I've tried setting, uh, I've, I've followed his instructions and I've set up a, a, few, a few own cloud services myself, but it is pretty hard, but basically all of it should be automatable. So I think this would be another really big use uh, case for our customers and, uh, and for our users and potentially eventually down the line for Red Hat customers. Uh, <coughs> Finally, uh, right. on you're on the wrong side. That's why. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, right. And so, we're all. I'm also talking with some of the, fo the folks over at CoLab, uh, who are working on developing a, con a container-based solution for a groupware server. Their uh, their email and calendaring and uh, uh, all the content management in there. So that basically, I would love for Fedora to be able to say. Out of the box, we have an answer to Microsoft Exchange. And best of all, it's not Microsoft Exchange. Uh, Is it Microsoft Exchange running on one? <laughs> Security! <laughs> uh, no, uh, and, and the idea should be that these are things that basically every business has to deploy at some point. Why are we making it so hard? I mean. We have a lot of excellent and, and, and brilliant people in the Fedora community, but we've, we've never been really great at focusing their attention on integration. We've been great at developing technology, but not at necessarily delivering technology. And so that's where I think our major focus has to be. The last point on this slide is about uh, a general purpose file server, which we also get, uh, which we also get a lot of uh, requests for. And this is a very big concept because this means different things to different people. Uh, are we talking about Samba? Are we talking about NFS? Are we talking about Ceph? Are we talking about Gluster? Um, are we talking about all of them and do we configure them all from a single role? So this is uh, still very much in its infancy and we're trying to figure out where to go with that, which is why I think we're gonna focus on solving at least a few particular use cases before we get uh, to a general purpose case. Two, two words that I just hope would be on the Sure, they are, but what I would add to the slide would be um, IoT and big data. Um, Two separate things, but those are those are those are things that are not 
yet on the immediate, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, for the recording, the, the question was uh, what about IoT and big data? And the answer is we don't currently have formal plans around those simply because we don't actually have anyone uh, who's pushing for them in the community. So uh, if that's you, we would love to hear from you. Um, and and I, I don't mean that sarcastically. I mean, everything in Fedora happens because somebody wants it enough that they put up some of the time to do it. And right now, we don't really have an IoT constituency in the server working group. We don't have a big data constituency. Uh, but those are absolutely things that we would love to support. We just don't have the expertise handy. So. So what are some of the techniques that we're going to use to get uh, to, the, to this uh, wonderful world domination future? Uh, one of the things that we're really focusing on is uh, we wanted to, to start really defining the Fedora server as a platform that provides a certain set of interfaces, as opposed to a distribution that provides a set of packages. What we want to do is we want to gather up a listing of what are the interfaces that we feel are sufficiently stable that we can say, if you build using these, they're not going to change next release. They might, and in fact, they may not change. Uh, we, we will say at least three releases will maintain compatibility for this. And we will publish this documentation in a common place, something like, I, I, I hate to keep going back to referring to Microsoft, but there are certain things they do very well, and one of those is the MSDN. You only have to go one place to figure out what, what are all the interfaces I can use to write my software. So we need to do something like that. And, and, if there are any documentation people in the room, I'm sure they're twitching because, of course, that's a lot of work, and it's not something I'm, I'm attempting to push, push directly onto them. Uh, but and this needs to come from the engineering groups as well. But I think by being able to start defining a platform, we start being able to define what is in Fedora and what is on Fedora, and being able to really give a better and clearer view of what you, what you can rely on. So how are we going to do some of that? Uh, a major piece of that is uh, there's, there's some folks working on things like LibAbigail and other technologies that can detect uh, API and ABI changes automatically. So what we're doing is we're working on a series of Taskatron uh, uh, tasks that uh, will automatically run on every Koji build, every, not Scratch build, but every Koji build, and report back to you whether or not, uh, com as compared to the currently stable release of that package, have you broken the ABI? Have you changed it in any way? Uh, have you, is, is it, a, for, uh, is it a, a clear ABI break or is it, you know, maybe this, inter maybe this interface changed but it's opaque? Uh, some of the, uh, these, these are important things and the, the thing that we're really shooting for here is that if such breakage happens, uh, we'll turn off the ability to, pu to push the, uh, the update uh, automatically. Uh, that any kind of an update that happens after that point must require human intervention to say, no, I'm sure, do this. And that should help us uh, avoid some of, the, uh, some of the classic Fedora moves too fast problems, because really what that amounts to is, well, yeah, we move, we, we move fast and we break things, but did we really need to break that? We should have to think about are we breaking this for a reason, or are we, or are we breaking this uh, just because it's the newest thing? And if it's just because it's the newest thing, maybe we have to maybe we have to look at, com at maintaining a compatibility plan for a while. Um, a couple, uh, some other things that I'd like to work with uh, again the free IPA people on is uh, improved certificate management. We've got a number of services that we ship in Fedora, in Fedora Server and some roles that we deploy. And what I'd like to do is be able to. Uh, as we continue our, start, our assumptions that we're going to be work deploying in a domain controlled by free IPA, I'd like to make sure that we have this role deployment where we're pulling uh, certificates the proper way. And that when we enroll uh, a, a, you know, a client machine with RealmD, that we automatically update the cockpit uh, self-signed certificate with one that's signed by the, uh, by the domain so that we don't have uh, all those self-signed certificate problems. So these are things. Uh, and. Again, not entirely on the free IPA people. These are things that I'm, uh, I've been working on a few hacks to Realm D, for example, and I'm going to be push, uh, you know, trying to push a few patches upstream uh, to accomplish some of this. But I, I think everybody in this room knows that certificate management is hard, painful, necessary, but something nobody wants to deal with if they can help it. So I think anything we can do there by starting to be able to make these assumptions that certain infrastructures in place, we can start to reduce that impact on end users so that they only have to worry about the certificate 
strategy that we are uh, providing. And the last and uh, most uh, exciting piece, I think, uh, one of the things that we're working on with, uh, I talked about how we're, we use the memcache role as a uh, prototype. We want to start building out as many of the roles that we deploy onto our server as uh, Kubernetes, uh, as molecule apps or atomic apps um, that are powered essentially by a local uh, Kubernetes cluster, a one, a one machine Kubernetes cluster, where the idea is that you know you start your small business or your home office and you deploy IPA, you run you run a few of these roles, but as you grow, we want to make sure that you're able to grow into uh, the new atomic environments and the new uh, you know these new cloud-based Kubernetes and uh, and uh, OpenShift environments, and the idea should be that if we do this right, all we should really need to be able to do is point these roles at uh, the new Kubernetes cluster, and then just simply migrate the services into the cluster with minimal effort on the uh, on the part of the uh, uh, of the uh, the ad admins, and take away that huge barrier. Right now, it's it's very much you're either a traditional admin or your whole world is the cloud. But getting from A to B is really hard and for many people requires a complete retooling of their environment. And if we can allow them to step there in, in, in their own time and in their, with their own comfort, then I think we, uh, we help people migrate into these new uh, workflows. So that is, uh, that was stuff I was hoping to get in for, uh, for Fedora 23, but at this point, uh, I'm probably gonna end up doing my work in Rawhide and I suspect it'll, it'll land uh, for Fedora 24. Uh, but uh, I'd certainly appreciate as much help as anyone would like to give, because this is a, a big effort, but I think it's going to have a lot of long-term impact. Uh, so, oh. so, the API compatibility protection is that going to be on the client side and like the React side thing? No, the idea is that that'll be part of the uh, build system and the, okay. the update system, so that you shouldn't get this stuff on your client. You, this stuff should not make it to your client. It should be uh, solved before it gets pushed to the repository. Right, so it's more like the all-night QA. Yes, right, and the Taskatron is a, is a service being provided by the Q, by Fedora QA to do automatic, automatic testing of certain things, particularly in the build system. Uh, sorry, the, uh, for the recording, the, que the question was, uh, how, you know, how how does the uh, ABI automatic detection work? And it's uh, going to be done as part of the build system before it gets into customers into users' hands. I keep saying customers, and I don't know why I do that. Uh, because we're, because it, certainly it's this all affects uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux downstream, but it very much affects our Fedora users as well. And if, not, if we don't have people working and developing in Fedora, we don't have a downstream either. So that is uh, pretty much everything I had to say. I, I would love to hear any of your other questions. I know a few came up during the talk, but. Uh, okay, so with Abigail, do you see that as it being specifically compressed into the server, or is it just kind of applicable to the server as well as other things that you pitch? All right, so the question was Lib Abigail and the ABI uh, detection. Do I see that as being spe specifically interesting to server, or is that useful to all of the other things? I think it is absolutely useful all over the place, and probably it belongs, uh, and I, I know where you're, you're actually going here, is which working group should be, should be owning this and driving it. Uh, and Ultimately, like I said before, Fedora is done by those who do the work, and right now the Fedora server group is the group that really wants to see this done. So they've kind of we, we've kind of adopted it as our puppy, and we will raise it. We will raise it to a dog, and if and then, then if somebody else wants to adopt that dog, great. But it is it is definitely specifically interesting to us, but it is not exclusively interesting to us. Back. Can you name that dog? Can we name that dog Kerberos? Um, I think that one's taken, but uh, I'll get back to you. How difficult is it to uh, write these roles? How difficult is it to write these roles? Um, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, at the moment, uh, impossible. And, and that's simply because uh, they were mo of moderate complexity, but we were, uh, the upstream for Rollkit, the, uh, the, the, pack the packaging service that uh, is providing this, is completely redesigning how we do this so that uh, it was very, it was moderately difficult and they generally had to be built in tree. We're completely rebuilding it so that now you can, so that you can build third party out of tree roles with minimal effort. So uh, 
end, when, when we're done with this, I'm hoping that it should be very easy. It's just going to be writing a little bit of Python. So in a, my, my goal is it should be writing in a little bit of Python that, fill, that, uh, that implements the deploy function and, or the, and the decommission function and uh, that, that everything else uh, should, be, uh, should be pretty much handled by the infrastructure. So uh, I, was going, uh, I was originally going to be giving a write your first server role uh, workshop on uh, Saturday. Uh, however, because we decided to completely revamp this, uh, I've, I've turned that into a Rolkit hack fest because anything we, ta anything we talked about on Saturday would no longer be true on Sunday. <laughs> uh, so uh, as of, uh, as of uh, right now, fairly complicated, by them, but uh, with the new design that we've got, I think it's going to be fairly easy. Uh, and most easy to make it for the person that we're upstream that, uh, that owns this technology to do it because they'll be most familiar. Essentially, it's, like I said, implementing the deploy, which is basically an installer. It's okay. basically an installer written in Python, and you can exec whatever it is you want. Provide a bit of perspective on what rings means to server. Um, well, uh, so as I talked about before, as far as uh, providing a platform, and I'm, I'm wary to, to go into the ring zero, ring one, ring two num uh, numerology because uh, nobody can see, and nobody yet has come up with a firm definition of what those mean, but. Fedora server, at least, for whatever ring number it turns out to be, I want those interfaces, and not the, not the packages again, but the interfaces to be Fedora server. So maybe that's, you know, that, that is definitely a ring. Uh, things that are built on top of those services uh, are certainly an outer, uh, an outer ring, and they may, uh, they may be built in Fedora, in the Fedora repositories, or they may be been, uh, built in Copper, or they may be third-party ISVs that are closed source, as long as they're using the known interfaces. So. To me, the only ring that is really important is that platform, that we, that we have a defined platform interface and that that corresponds to a ring. Uh, I can't, uh, I, I am largely coming up with this on the spot, so uh, my opinion may change by the end of the day, but uh, yeah, I think that's about where I would put the, I'm not, I'm not sure I would uh, bother with describing more than two rings in terms of what is interesting to the server. It's either inside the interface line or outside of it. So it's all about the platform. So it's all about the platform. In the back? Yeah. I'm curious how you contrast the server API standardization effort with the tools and the other standardization system in the Linux world. All right. How do I contrast the, uh, the server API effort with the Linux standard base? Uh, I don't, honestly. Um, <coughs> The Linux standard base is, is interesting, and uh, I suspect that when all is said and done, it will end up being a subset, uh, uh, pro uh, probably a, whole, a wholly encompassed or mostly encompassed uh, subset of what is the server uh, interface line. Uh, but we are we are aiming to include certain uh, certain things like the uh, like the Rollkit interface and like the, and like Cockpit as actually being part of the interface we provide, uh, and those are certainly not uh, anything that the LSP would ever. Likely to include. Is that uh, a sufficient answer? Well, uh, I'm more curious about uh, what you think of the judge's prospects of what the real server API being compared to the historical prospects of the LSP and the proposal to deal with standardization with it and whether there's any cost. Um, so, the, uh, to, to re uh, restate the question, um, I, I guess the question is how do we measure the which, uh, which interfaces qualify? as opposed to the classic problem that LSPs have never been able to really solve that. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. It's, uh, to a certain degree, it's going to be designed by committee. Uh, it'll ultimately be, it, it will ultimately be the, de the decision of the uh, server working group and what they feel is, whether or not they feel that something is sufficiently ubiquitous as to be worthy of uh, focusing efforts on maintaining it for a long period. Uh, and that's kind of an I don't, I'll know it when I see it situation, but uh, I don't have a better answer at the moment. Uh, I have a comment. Um, the way I thought uh, it would make sense to do this in Fedora workstation 
is to identify some important uh, third party apps, like for example, I don't know, Chrome, uh, VirtualBox, Steam, maybe come to my mind, and, and, just, uh, and just make sure that they continue working from one Fedora release to another, and that's the interface stability for you. Right, and well, okay, so uh, the statement was that from the workstation perspective, one of the ways that they're looking at this is from the consumer side, pick a, uh, pick a selection of highly important uh, applications, and then just make sure that the, API, that the API to support them continues to do so. And that's, uh, that's certainly one way to look at it, uh, and I think that's kind of what we're doing with the roles as well, is that we're, the, the, server, the server interface will always, uh, make, we will always make sure that it's capable of supporting the roles that we, uh, are, that we have capably configured to deploy on them. Uh, and that's a bit of a chicken and egg problem because, of course, as we allow to start allowing third-party roles, then we have to start figuring out where exactly the interface line is to say, well, you should really be using these. Um, I think it's a balancing act, uh, how, much of, how much of one we did it take versus the other. And again, that's likely going to be a decided when we come across it uh, in the situation. How much time do we have? Got two minutes. I've probably got time for one more question. Is there even really a network for repositories? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it is not. I uh, forgot to update the last page. Uh, jump back to the first page. Thank you for your time.